morning. Leslie is a gem in our community. He spends his time reading interesting things. Unfortunately, he shares them all with us. So I will turn, turn over the program to Leslie, who's going to share with us the Bolivian Schindler. Can you let the full screen? Oh, okay. Good morning. Um, thank you to City for her kind words. I have to thank also Rabbi Katz, whose machinery we are using and the software we are using in his room. We've got the run of his room. It's very good of him. We really appreciate it. And uh, that's why you can see the final cats in the bottom corner of the screen and not my head or the library bed. I've also got to thank my son Johnny, who's here managing all the technical bits. And uh, all of you for turning up this morning, or even a couple, I believe, and maybe more from the United Kingdom. Great. Let's start. The title of this lecture refers to a familiar piece of history. But this isn't really very close to the Schindler story at all. It wasn't my idea, this title. It came from Bolivia itself, as you will hear. Some questions at the outset. The Nazis never invaded or ruled Bolivia, which is in South America. So how could there be a Bolivian Schindler? In fact, how could the Nazis do anything in Bolivia from thousands of miles away? The subject of this lecture lived for much of his life in Bolivia, and during that period was a proud, proud Bolivian. So what could he have in common with Schindler, a German citizen who lived in Another question. My subject was widely hated in Bolivia during his lifetime, and long after he'd done it. The government, the Bolivian government and people, now proudly sing his praises. How did this happen? I hope to answer these and many more questions. First of all, who was he? His name was Moritz Hochschild, which indicates the German origin of his family. He was born on February the 17th, 1881, into a Jewish family that had then been involved in the mining industry for more than a generation. His place of birth was Biblis, a small town in Western Germany between Darmstadt and Mannheim. He was the eldest son of a Jewish general trader, but his father had two cousins involved in the metal industry. In 1881, a company was incorporated in the Frankfurt am Main and named Metallgesellschaft, AG, AG being like Inc. in America or LTD Limited in England. The company traded in various metals. One of the three founders was a man named Wilhelm Ralph Merton, and another was Wilhelm's father, Ralph Merton. The third was a man named Leo Ellinger. Although this was a joint stock company, it was run like a family business. The Mertens brought in a cousin named Zachary Holtschild, and he became a partner in Metal Gesellschaft and the manager of its marketing and international activities. Europe was then more and more dependent on imported metals. In 1884, Metal Gesellschaft sent Zachary's brother, Bertolt Hochschild, to the USA to establish a subsidiary, oper subsidiary operation there. And in 1887, Bertolt set up the American Metal Company, another joint stock company, which was later 51% owned by Metal Gesellschaft. The timing was excellent because American Metal Company then expanded a great deal, mostly due to Germany's demand for copper. The Germans were soon consuming one third of United States export. I don't intend to say very much more about American Metal Company or Metal Gesellschaft Allgemeine, AG, but they are there in the background throughout the period covered by this lecture. 
As I've said, Moritz Hochschild, my subject, was born in 1881, the same year as Matal Gesellschaft. Though born to Jewish parents, he was agnostic. After he graduated from school, he studied mining and engineering at the Freiburg University of Mining and Technology. His father was determined that his sons should receive first class educations as mining engineers. In 1905, Moritz began his career with Metal Gesellschaft, working in the accounting department, but he was soon appointed the company's agent in Spain and later was sent to Australia to manage a copper mine there. Eventually, he moved to Chile. His uncle provided him with some capital, with which he set up a small business dealing in metal ores. His brother Sally joined him in that business. Moritz Hochschild did very well in that business from 1911 until 1914, and was able to amass some capital of his own by his skill in the copper market. He then returned to Germany, where he served during World War I, mostly procuring metals for his country. In 1918, he married Kata Rosenbaum, and their first child was born in 1920. After the war ended, he returned to Chile, but soon fell out with his brother, and they parted company, dividing the country between them. Sally took all the business in central and southern Chile, and Moritz took the north. They didn't speak to each other after that for the next 50 years. Moritz moved to Bolivia, and over the next 20 years, <coughs> he built up an economic empire based in Bolivia, but stretching from Peru to Chile, based on tin ore. He became known in South America as Don Mauricio. Slide two, if you want to. This is a picture of Horschild sometime during this period. In 1924, his wife died. During this period of expansion, various members of the family emigrated to join him in South America. As one might expect, most of them ended up working for him. One of these new employees was a cousin named Philip Hochschild, who brought with him his wife, Germaine. Moritz Hochschild commenced a torrid affair with Germaine, and ultimately she divorced Philip and married Moritz. Before I continue with his story, I want to try and paint some sort of picture of the country and its population at the time with which we are concerned, because its history and the resulting domestic situation had considerable influence on the way and some other countries. Bolivia was originally called Alta Alta and gained its independence from Spain in 1824. By that time, a large proportion of the population had been converted to Christianity, becoming Roman Catholics. Before that, during the 16th century, large numbers of Jews or new Christians fleeing the Iberian Peninsula because of persecution by the Roman Catholic Church and its Inquisition found refuge in Bolivia, where the church was much more relaxed than in Europe. Most settled around. Sorry, most settled around the silver mines of Potosi in southern Bolivia, but some were in other centres of trade. Many intermarried with Christians and integrated into the local communities and the local church. However, many of those retained Sephardic names and kept Jewish practices such as Shabbat Kabbalah and even Shiva until early in the 20th century. For centuries, Christian families treasured Jewish heirlooms, such as silver candlesticks. In the early years of the 20th century, a few more Jews arrived, fleeing Eastern European persecution. Very few Jews actually settled in the country, maybe somewhere between 100 
and at most 200. <clears throat> then the Nazi persecution of the Jews started and a few Jews found their way to Bolivia. They found a primitive country, much of it at high altitudes in the Andes. It was the month, one of the most underdeveloped, poor and unstable countries in South America. It was blessed with abundant valuable minerals, but the local population knew nothing of that. Bolivian society was divided into two main groups, each with its own history and culture, insofar as they had culture. Only five to 10% of the population was white, meaning of European stock, mostly of Spanish, Roman Catholic origin and language. In practice, that minority ran the country. The next slide, which, you all, which uh, shows some of them, those you see were obviously, well, next slide, if you will. This is Hochschild at an exhibition in La Paz in 1943. We'll be returning to this picture in due course. Can we go up to me? Can we stop sharing? I'm oh, sorry, okay. The second group were, broadly speaking, of Indian origin. They spoke various Indian languages and as a class were less educated than the whites. I use the term Indian to signify the Aboriginal inhabitants of the land. In other words, they were South American Indians belonging to various tribes. One quite large group within this group were the Cholos, who considered themselves a cut above the rest. These were people of mixed blood, having one Indian parent and one Caucasian or Mestizo parent. Mestizos were themselves of mixed parentage, one parent being Indian and the other European. The Cholos dressed in their own unique Cholo style. Mark one. There we are, good. This slide shows Cholo women in their best clothes. They're in their Sunday best. Slide on, the next slide. This slide shows Cholo children in their best clothes. Again, their Sunday best. Um, and obviously very much set up and posing for the photograph with the pet lambs or the young lambs and so on. The rest of this Indian group, the third and largest group, about 70% of the population, were the pure-blooded Indians who constituted the lowest lower class. Slide one. No, you missed one. Oh, some of these are wrong. Okay. These the men were manual workers, servants, farmers, miners, and soldiers. They were described as having no culture and no civilization. They lived much as they had lived for centuries. Electricity, gas, running water, all were undreamed of by almost everybody in Bolivia. Sanitation was virtually unknown. People would just relieve themselves wherever they were even in a crowded street, without anyone being embarrassed. I repeat, this was an extremely primitive society. These two are, I know what went wrong there, these two are the rest of the, in, sorry, <coughs> these two are upper class Cholo women. I think they're upper class because there are elements of Western dress in their clothing that indicates they were upper class. And the next slide shows the Indian people to whom I was referring to if you don't mind. There we are. There are two women again in their Sunday best. These are the pure-blooded Indians. Okay. I return to Moritz Hochschild. I think it's clear that's of you. I, in the 1930s, Moritz Hochschild or Don Mauricio, his wealth and power and influence in Bolivia were steadily increasing, as were the political and economic influence of his offshore group. He was one of three business tycoons 
who were known as the three Bolivian tin barons, the other two being Simon Ituri Patino and Carlos Victor Alamayo. All three had, to quote one right on the subject, abysmal reputation. Between them, they controlled most of the world's supply of tin at the time. Moritz Hofschild was considered short-tempered and ruthless, greedy and unprincipled. The head of the Latin American section of the United States State Department wrote the following description of him during that period. I'll spare you my attempt at the American accent. Although possessing a very pleasing and ingratiating personality, he has proved to be unscrupulous, unreliable, and extremely hard-boiled in all of his business dealings. Next to Patino, I would presume that he's the most disliked person in Bolivia. Patino was, of course, the first of the three Bolivian tin barons I mentioned. Patino had made his fortune through realizing that a tin mine named La Lagua was potentially extraordinarily rich, and he made a huge fortune developing and exploiting it. The result was that the world's industrial nations beat as paths to his door when they required tin, and the demand for Bolivian tin rocketed. Moritz Hochschild operated in Patino's shadow, but that didn't hamper his otherwise making a fortune out of Bolivian tin. He had four schemes, like Patino's La Agua. Only one was a big success, but he made money from them all and from his other dealings in tin and tin ores and other ores. Until this period, most dealings in ores had been conducted by general dealers who viewed tin ores as just a part of their businesses. Hochschild was a specialist in ores and quickly became the largest ore dealer in Bolivia. He eventually realized that the best approach was not to deal was to deal not just in tin and tin ore, but also in the mines that produced them. And he introduced the system for making money out of the mines that were considered, out of mines that were considered to be worked out. In a nutshell, he persuaded a European with which he dealt to inquire into the possibility of extracting tin from low grade ore, which had previously been treated as worthless and accumulated on mine tips. Of course, being considered worthless, it could be acquired for song. While the price of tin had soared to previously undreamed of heights, the company in Europe developed a method of smelting the low grade ore in such a way that it was uneconomical to operate, but produced high grade tin. Consignments of low grade ore, which had previously been regarded as worthless, brought substantial profits to Hochschild, who'd been buying up worked out old tin mines, including their tips, very cheaply. I don't intend to say very much more about his money-making activities. If you want to know more about them, there's a book by Helmut Waschkis, a book by Helmut Waschkis with a somewhat forbidding title, Dr. Moritz Don Mauricio Hochschild, 1881 to 1965, The Man and His Companies, a German Jewish mining entrepreneur in South America. Well, there's the book. I have to confess, I haven't read it. But it's said to be a fascinating account of a fascinating subject how one man with some bright ideas made a large fortune. There is an excellent critical review of the Waschke's book, which provides much more information than a conventional book review, which was written by Professor John Hillman of Trent University. That I have read. One of Hochschild's important tactics seems to have been to get into high society in Bolivia, which gave him ready access to powerful figures in the country. There you can switch to the next one. That he could, thus he could use political influence to achieve his goals. Here he is, cultivating or using it. You've already seen this slide. Slide. It's the next slide. After the book. There it is. 
You've already seen this slide. It is actually Maurice Hochschild at an exhibition in La Paz in 1943. The contrast between those in this photo and those in the slides of the other elements of La Paz society is obvious. <clears throat> of course, his political influence coupled with his financial wealth led to anti-Semitic slurs on, and attacks on him, and he was reviled and hated by most Bolivians. Meanwhile, in Europe in the late 1930s, Nazi policy was to allow Jews to emigrate. But if they did, they were deprived automatically of their German citizenship, making them stateless. The Nazis also ensured that when they left, the Jews took little money and no valuables at all with them. Moritz Hochschild helped many such Jews to obtain Bolivian visas for themselves and their families, and then to find passages by ship across the Atlantic to South America. He arranged and paid for the passages of many of them, either by way of loans or outright gifts. It seemed clear that he spent vast sums of his own money on getting these penniless refugees out of Europe and across to Bolivia, where most of them were stranded for years that they were alive. Slide if you will, John, slide, slide. This is a group typical of the refugees whom he helped. I can't be certain, but I suspect this photo was taken before they left Europe. How did Hochschild do what I've described? Between 1937 and 1939, the president of Bolivia was a man named German Bush. Moritz Hochschild was then at the peak of his economic and political influence, moving in the highest social circles, and he had managed to make President Bush his friend. Late in 1937, or perhaps very early in 1938, he set about using his influence with Bush to open Bolivia to Jewish refugees from Nazi persecution, mostly from Germany itself. As I mentioned, there was a good deal of anti-Semitism in Bolivia. It was mainly the result of conservative Roman Catholic teaching. An aggravating factor was the presence in South America of many German agents, really Nazi agents, who were seeking to advise Nazi interests and philosophy in which, as everyone knows, anti-Semitism was so important. Hitler had his eyes on the mineral wealth of the country to exploit when he had won the war and was rebuilding Germany's economy. Almost certainly, he also had his eye on the presence of an abundance of primitive, ignorant, and above all cheap manual labor. Clearly, Hochschild would have to tread carefully. He played his cards skillfully and successfully for some time. He persuaded President Bush that Jewish refugees could be a valuable resource for Bolivia. He let Nazi propaganda help to convince Bush and his officials that Jews all had access to money and, and contacts that would help them settle in Bolivia and make a substantial contribution to the development of the country. The idea of substantial investment in the country by North American Jews was particularly attractive to Bush and his administration. Hochschild was like a master pianist, playing on the prejudices and ideas of many of those in power in Bolivia, led by his friend, the president. What he was able to do was secure the issue of directions to various branches of the civil service to facilitate the admission to the country of German Jewish refugees. It was thought that because they had all been educated in Germany, they would have absorbed much German culture and would help educate the primitive lower classes in Bolivia and thus advance its development, especially its economy. Hochschild then used his contacts inside Germany to let Jews, desperate to find refuge from the increasing persecution by the Nazis, to let them know that Bolivia would accept many of them. 
thousands of Jews wrote to him, and he would pass on details of them to the Bolivian civil service to facilitate the issue of visas allowing their admission to the country. All this was conducted without publicity. Few people in Bolivia knew what was going on until Jewish refugees started entering the country. Because of the large primitive Indian community, conditions even in the large towns and cities were unpleasant in the eyes of the new immigrants from Europe, most of whom promptly decided to go elsewhere and hence regarded Bolivia as a kind of transient home. They called it Hotel Bolivia. <clears throat> they decided that as soon as they could, they would move on either back to Europe or to some other more cosmopolitan South American country or to the United States. I'm going to pass over their journeys from Europe and their sentiments and experience during them. I ought, however, to repeat that some of them did not have the financial ability to pay the fares for the ship to South America. In such cases, as I've said, Hochschild often paid the fares himself. If you want to know more about this aspect of it, there are extensive descriptions of many of these matters in a recently published book called Hotel Bolivia, which is a source of much of my background material. Slide if you will. There it is. That's the cover of Hotel Bolivia. A lot of the refugees were the victims of various frauds. Con men took their money, but provided nothing in return. Some refugees, most of them in fact, arrived in Bolivia penniless. Some only to discover that documents that they had bought at high prices in Europe and that were supposed to smooth their way into Bolivia and inside the country turned out at their destination to be false leaving them in limbo. And the country, as I've said more than once, was very, very primitive. The immigrant ships mostly discharged their human cargo in a port called Arica in Chile, close to its northern border with Peru. And that is not on the next slide. Thank you. Can I like that up? I'll use my pointer. You can see La Paz there very clearly. And down to the left is the border between Chile and Peru over here. And about where my pointer is pointing, Johnny now is in more or less the same place, is a town, a port town called Arica. And that's where the ships discharge their human cargo onto dry land, which in fact was in the very northernmost part of Chile. From there, they took a railway that went all the way up to La Paz. My point, of course, went straight there, but they went in a very roundabout route because on the way there, they were climbing up the Andes. La Paz is the city that is the capital of Bolivia. The journey was 440 kilometers or 273 miles, which doesn't sound like very much by railway today. <clears throat> so many took this journey that locals called the train the Express Pudio, or the yeah. Jewish Express. If they didn't have money for the fare, Hofschild would provide it. The train took two days, stopping overnight at a frontier town called, in Bolivia, called Charana, Charania, where there were virtually no facilities for the use of passengers. And from there the next morning, the train was set up on the second leg of its journey to La Paz. It was a nightmare journey, climbing up through the Andes Mountains to a height of more than 14,000 feet. And most of the new immigrants promptly started suffering from altitude sickness. When the train finally approached La Paz, it descended into a sort of bowl in the mountain where the city of La Paz was located at a height of 11,942 feet, nearly 12,000 feet, 3,640 meters above sea level. When they finally arrived, 
feeling sick and ill. They found themselves in totally alien surroundings and badly in need of help, both immediately and in the longer term. Moritz Hofschild sorted out their problem. Initially, he did so informally, using money out of his own resources to meet immediate needs. But then got things better organized. He founded SOPRO, or SOPRO, the full name of which translated into English was Society for the Protection of Jewish Immigrants. It provided money and tangible help to assist the new arrivals to get on their feet. It took thousands of dollars each month to keep SOPRO functioning and provide the finance for the, that assistance. Hochschild personally contributed every penny of the money that was needed. He also set up houses where the new arrivals could live for a time while getting themselves organized in this strange country. It isn't clear whether these were run by the staff of SOPRO or more, direct, or more directly by Hochschild. And it really doesn't matter because whoever it was, he was providing the necessary money. Some money for his schemes eventually came from the US Joint, the American Joint Distribution Committee, but he provided a much larger proportion of the expenses. Later, he founded another organization for the benefit of Jewish refugees. It was, so, it was called Socopo, again, a name made from the Spanish word that gave it its full title, which I can neither pronounce nor translate. Sorry. Sokobo's main function was to manage three agricultural estates that Hofschild had bought to provide places where Jewish refugees could live and work. It was also to manage any other agricultural estates or projects that he might buy or set up in the future. <clears throat> Could we have slides to the next slide? Thank you. This is Hofschild at his desk, sometime during or just after this period. It is obviously a poised picture, but if you look at the back, you can see a project for one of these agricultural settlements, and he's actually got plans and photographs <coughs> on his desk. He also employed Jewish refugees in his mining business. He helped refugees buy and find housing, advancing loans to enable these purchases. Professionals such as doctors, dentists and the like, had little difficulty in finding work while they learned Spanish. Those with any sort of technical training also had no difficulty in establishing themselves. Technicians were in very short supply. Those new arrivals who were willing to set up cafes or restaurants could found small businesses, especially, especially as Hochschild would readily advance starting capital. Because literacy was at a premium, anyone who knew or was willing to learn Spanish could usually find a job of some kind. Nevertheless, many of them found themselves without any means of earning a living. For them, Hofschild organized the agricultural settlements. I should have said for some of them. Hofschild organized the agricultural settlements I've mentioned, where they could live with others of their own kind while working in agriculture or perhaps in some local industry. The problem they faced was that the primitive natives could do unskilled work at rates far below what they needed to keep their families. Nevertheless, the refugees strove to overcome the difficulties they faced. Because they didn't like either the work or the conditions, some of the refugees in the settlements left and went back to the cities. Others stayed and overcame the difficulties as best they could. In fact, the settlements were never a total success, but they did help the refugees keep body and soul together while their owners settled down and became a kind of size. No doubt there were many other problems, but with Hulshield's help, they were overcome with more or less success. Schools were organized in La Paz and elsewhere for the Jewish refugee children. Slide if you want to. This slide shows those at a Sopro school 
in La Paz in 1944. I count 43 children in this photograph, but there may be more, and there are three teachers as well. I say there may be more, but if you look at them, the face is appearing out or not even managing to be seen, just the top of somebody's head from behind others. So 43 of the guests. Other facilities were also provided. Next slide, if you will, Johnny. This is a Sopro home for, sorry, yeah, Sopro home for the aged in the early 1940s. I count 16 people there, but some may, of course, be staff. Once World War II broke out, most of the escape routes were closed. However, some ingenious Jews found ways out and would get to a neutral country such as Portugal. For them, for some time, help could still be obtained from Morris Fortune, and refuse, refugees continued to arrive from time to time, long after the outbreak of war. Hofschild would make arrangements for them as he had for their predecessors. As time went on, difficulties arose for Moritz Hochschild himself. Late in, 19, late in 1939, he was arrested and threatened with execution. But somehow or other, he obtained his own release. The same happened again in 1943, with the same threats to kill him, but rather more immediacy about him. He was again freed eventually, but this time, because of the threats that had been made, he promptly left Bolivia never to return. By this time, he had substantial mining and financial interests in other countries in South America, especially Chile, so he still had a good livelihood. In 1951, he and his family donated the majority of their fortune to the Hochschild Trust and Foundation. And his business continued to function until 1952. But the year I've mentioned, 1951, there was a national revolution in Bolivia and the Hochschild group was nationalized. The family received 30% of their former assets, which was enough to ensure that all were properly provided for. The group itself continued to trade quite successfully and expanded worldwide. A couple more slides. The next one, please, Johnny. There we are. This is Moritz Hofschild as he aged. His moustache, as you see, is now grey. The cigar is more in evidence and the coffee cup at his side. Once he'd left Bolivia, Moritz Hochschild was widely vilified and he remained one of those most hated there. Outside Bolivia, in 1961, he inaugurated the Mantos Blancos copper mine in Chile, which became his most successful mining operation, though its biggest profits came after his death. He died in exile, as I've mentioned, in 1965, at the age of 84. Because of his reputation when he died, he certainly wasn't born in Bolivia. He was, as I've said, vilified and hated. While Hochschild's rescue efforts were going on, they received virtually no publicity. That was, from his point of view, by design. The anti-Semites would have had a field there. Did you change the street to a shopping mall? That's how things stood until, sorry, it changed down, but we don't need that. No, <laughs> never mind. That's how things stood until one day in 2017 three and a half, four years ago, when workmen in a building belonging to what had been the Hochschild group, Hochschild group came across a pile, pile of old documents mouldering away in some storeroom. They were ragged, many dirty, many were filthy. Some garbage were mixed up with them. They were thoroughly unattractive. But some workmen started going through them. Pile of paper, nobody knew what was there. They were astonished by what they found. The papers, filthy as they were, bore mute testimony to Moritz Hochschild's feverish efforts 
to rescue Jews from the approaching Holocaust. There was a documentary evidence of his efforts to obtain visas, to provide housing, to provide jobs, to provide schools, to provide all kinds of other aid. There were visas that had never been sent because of the outbreak of war. There were also pleas for visas that had been successfully processed, letters to and from Africans, and so on. There is now an archive of these papers, I think in La Paz, to which the public can gain admittance. Now that slide is still gone. This is the this is the archivist at work in the archive. Now a typical item from the archive. Next slide. This appears to be, and I'm pretty sure it is, an early visa application form. Moritz Hochschild seems to have become known outside Bolivia as a philanthropist who would help Jews the world over. One letter found in this heap of documents is from, a French, from French authorities asking Hochschild to receive and settle a thousand Jewish orphans. Another letter from a Jewish candidate in La Paz in Bolivia, <coughs> excuse me, another letter from a Jewish kindergarten in La Paz in Bolivia, asks for Hochschild's help in expanding the school, quotes, in view of the number of children who are here and others who want to come. And then almost the last slide. This is a remarkable photograph. This is an ex-refugee holding his own records. That is to say, the records that were found in the pile of rubbish found there and now in a modern outer file. His name is there, I can't read it properly, but Senor George Zarco Stammer, something like that. The Bolivian press gave much publicity to these unexpected finds, and the result was a complete reversal of the way his many memory had been treated in Bolivia. Bolivians knew all about anti-Semitism. It was still widespread in their country, long after the defeat of the Nazis. Many of them are now questioning what they had been taught of their own national history. They suddenly discovered that a man they were brought up to believe was a bad man was actually an unrecognized rescuer of many oppressed German Jews. <clears throat> believe it or not, he's now a Bolivian national hero. Someone in the Bolivian press christened him the Bolivian Shimba after the German who saved around 1,200 Jews from certain deportation to the death camps. You will no doubt also recall that Oscar Schindler was a subject of a book and then a highly successful film called Schindler's List. Calling Mor Moritz Hofschild the Bolivian Schindler was quite unfair to Hofschild. To mention just one difference, Schindler made a good living out of the work of his Jews, while Hochschild's work saving Jews cost him an enormous amount of money. To mention another difference, the documents show that Hochschild had saved 9,000 Jews, 9,000. But that was not the whole story, for the documents were and are known to be incomplete. It is known that there were many survivors whom he had helped whose names did not appear in the documents that were found. In a letter written in 1940, Hochschild himself wrote that he had saved between 9,000 and 10,000 Jews. Up to then, nobody knows if that is an accurate estimate, but that was long after his work in this field, sorry, that was long after his work was over, but not all, not completely, because as I said before, a continuous trickle ran after that as the war progressed. One respectable source puts the likely number of beneficiaries of his effort as high as 12,000. There may, of course, have been more or less. We are unlikely ever to know the exact number of those whom he helped. 12,000 is 10 times the number rescued by Schindler. And as I've said, 
Schindler made a good living out of the work of his Jews. So much for the nickname, the Bolivian Schindler. But it fits right in the octopus. Here is my final slide, almost so. Don Maurizio, Moritz Hochschild in his old age. Another, before I finish, another side to Moritz Hochschild has received very little publicity. Many historians looking at his story recently and studying the papers that were discovered in 2017 believe that he must have been secretly helping political resistance to Nazi Germany. The archive director of the mining company in Bolivia, which is the name by which the nationalized Hochschild group is now known, is recorded as saying, I am convinced that Hochschild was part of the anti-fascist apparatus. In order to do what he did, he had to be a man linked to the resistance movements that were operating around the world. It isn't likely that we'll ever learn the whole story of this aspect of his life. But there are clearly tantalizing him somewhere. He he zikho aruch. Can you have the next slide, brother? Thank you. Shall I explain that you're uh, well talking still? Okay. We'll go back to a picture of me and I'll explain what's going on. Right. What's going to happen now is that Johnny will police those who want to ask questions if anybody does he will if you raise your hand so it will be visible on the screen put it by your head that's the best way he will look for you and call on you to speak no hands visible i've stunned everybody into silence okay if there's nothing more Siffy, do you want to wind up Leslie, thank you for giving your time. And thank you to Johnny for helping with the technical um, technical background. And exactly. Thank you to everyone for coming. Good morning. So it's goodbye from her and goodbye from me, obviously, whatever it is. Thanks, Johnny. Clearly.